In my short video, Paradise Stolen, I used the analogy that for the money spent on the war in the past 10 years, we could have built a small home on a small plot of land in a small community for every family in America. A common argument against this idea is that there just isn't enough room in all of America to provide people with decent homes in decent communities. But this argument is baseless and the result of lies and propaganda. We were lied to to convince us that there's so many people that we have to cram everyone into a high density housing in high density cities because there's not enough room on the planet. So let's dispose of this myth, the myth of overpopulation. The community portrayed in the video consists of 262 homes, but for our purposes we'll round it off to 250 homes. If we assume an average of three people per family, or one home for every three people, that would mean about 750 people live there. Including parks and playgrounds, the whole community sits on 12 acres of land. Now let's take the U.S. population of 320 million and divide them into communities of 750 people each, which gives us 426,666 villages. Each village sits on 12 acres, so multiply that by 12, equals 5,119,992 acres. Convert acres to square miles and we have just under 8,000 square miles. That means we could fit everyone in America in a one-story home with a front yard and a backyard with plenty of parks and playgrounds and waterways for every 750 people and it would all fit easily on the available land mass of the state of New Hampshire and still have a thousand square miles to spare. That could leave the entire rest of the country, including Alaska, without a single person living there. See now how ridiculous it is to think that the entire landmass of the U.S. cannot provide the needs and resources for a low-density population taking up less room than New Hampshire. But let's go further. Let's take the entire population of the planet, 7.3 billion people. We do the same math, 7.3 billion divided by 750 times 12 acres converted to square miles and we have 180,000 square miles. That means we could fit everyone in the world, every American, Canadian, Australian, Mexican, European, Russian, Muslim, African, Hindu, Chinese, Japanese, Indonesian and all of South America in a one-story home with a front yard and a backyard with plenty of parks and playgrounds and waterways for every 750 people and the entire world population could all fit easily on less than 75 percent of the available land mass of the state of Texas and still have 80,000 square miles of Texas to spare. But too many people is not the reason that half the population of the world has to live in hunger and squalor and the rest of us lives of desperation and alienation. So why are we being herded into these high density mega cities? We've already shown that it's not efficient and we know that there's plenty of room for everyone. Well, the answer is that a few dozen psychopaths want us to tear each other to pieces so that we won't unite against our slave masters. We are part of a giant laboratory experiment and each of us is just an expendable little white lab mouse. Don't believe me? Well, don't take my word for it. Let's go back 50 years and take a look at some experiments by a Dr. John Calhoun called Mouse Utopia. The work of Dr. John Calhoun at the National Institute of Health in Washington, D.C. has attempted to answer this question. In a unique experiment that took years to complete, Dr. Calhoun used white mice to study population growth and its effects on individual behavior. In this 16-cell mouse habitat, utopian conditions of nutrition, comfort, and housing were provided for a potential population of over 3,000 mice. Yet, in spite of ideal conditions, the mouse population met with catastrophe. 
the population of the mice doubled every 60 days. This was called the exploit period. The third period, consisting of 300 days, found the population of mice leveling off. This was called the equilibrium period. Dr. Calhoun noticed that the newer generations of young were inhibited, since most space was already socially defined. At this time, some unusual behavior became noticeable. Violence became prevalent. Excess males strived for acceptance, were rejected, and withdrew. Huddling together, they would exhibit brief flurries of violence among themselves. Other young mice growing into adulthood exhibited an even different type of behavior. Dr. Calhoun called these individuals the beautiful ones. Their time was devoted solely to grooming, eating, and sleeping. They never involved themselves with others, engaged in sex, nor would they fight. All appeared as a beautiful exhibit of the species, with keen alert eyes and a healthy, well-kept body. These mice, however, could not cope with unusual stimuli. Though they looked inquisitive, they were, in fact, very stupid. Dr. Calhoun called the last period the die phase, leading the population into extinction. Although the mouse utopia could house 3,000, the population began to decline at 2,200. In the shift from the equilibrium to the die phase, each animal became less aware of associates despite all animals being pushed closer together. Dr. Calhoun concluded that the mice could not effectively deal with the repeated contact of so many individuals. The evidence of violence increased to the point where most individuals had had their tails bitten to some degree. Eventually, the entire mouse population perished. What the filmmakers fail to mention is that these mice would never have behaved that way if they weren't trapped in the narrow confines of the experiment. These behaviors and conditions would never exist in nature. It is only an artificial, closed system that causes these problems. Still wonder why we are being herded into cities? When I met him at Findhorn, he said to me, where are you from? And I said, New York. He said, ah, New York, yes, that's a very interesting place. Do you know a lot of New Yorkers who keep talking about the fact that they want to leave but never do? And I said, oh, yes. And he said, why do you think they don't leave? He said, I think that New York is the new model for the new concentration camp, where the camp has been built by the inmates themselves, and the inmates are the guards, and they have this pride in this thing they've built. They've built their own prison, and so they exist in a state of schizophrenia, where they are both guards and prisoners, and as a result, they no longer have, having been lobotomized, the capacity to leave the prison they've made or to even see it as a prison.